Lindsay Brownell. I am an alumna of the graduate program in science writing at MIT, and I'm also a board member of COMMIT, um, the student group who is sponsoring this event. And um, joining me today is Gabby, who is also um, a member of COMMIT. And we are dedicated to um, bringing events to MIT students that are all about how to communicate your science outside of the scientific sphere, um, because we know that MIT is a wonderful bubble of science and, and sciencey folks, but we're obviously a very small the world. Um, and so leaving MIT and having to um, conduct science in a different context is something that we think is really important. Um, and based on our experiences, studying science communication and, and communicating science, um, we're really happy that we can bring events to a community like this, even though we're temporarily virtual. <laughs> um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, I think we're going to give people maybe a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. Um, also, we ask that you keep yourselves muted while the panel is going on. If you have questions that you would like to ask, feel free to drop them in the chat feature at the bottom of um, your Zoom screen. And Gabi is going to be um, keeping track of those questions. And then at the end, um, we are going to stop the conversation between the panelists and go to um, questions from the audience, probably the last 10 minutes or so, um, depending upon how much we get. So if you have questions along the way, definitely put them in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, I think though that was all the, the housekeeping that, that we had to go over. Um, so I'm going to really quickly just go through the, the bios for our three panelists to give everybody else um, a sense of who they are and, and why they are here. And hopefully everybody who wa wants to join will join in um, those intervening minutes. So um, we have Ray. Um, Ray, can you wave? So everyone knows who you are? Hello. Great. Ray is a PhD candidate in Media Technology and Society at Northwestern and a Rita Allen Foundation Civic Science Fellow at WGBH Nova. And she's also a producer at the Story Collider podcast. Her main fields of interest are science communication, misinformation, curiosity, public engagement with scientists, and science communication in media. And before starting her PhD, Ray worked as a health communication facilitator and cancer preventative palliative care campaign manager. Whew, that's a long title. <laughs> in Tehran, Iran. So welcome, Ray. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Our second panelist is Lee McIntyre. If you could wave Lee, he's the one with the really pretty cloud ceiling. He is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University and an instructor in ethics at the Harvard Extension School. He is formerly the executive director of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University. And he has also served as a policy advisor to the executive dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard and is the associate editor in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. He has written a number of books that deal with the intersection of science and society, including The Scientific Attitude, Post-Truth, and Dark Ages, The Case for a Science of Human Behavior. Welcome, Lee. Thanks for being here as a panelist. Thank you so much. And our third panelist is Daniel Jackson. And if you could just give a little wave to everybody. He is a professor and associate director at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab Laboratory, or CSAIL, as well as a McVicker faculty fellow. He's member of the editorial board of the MIT Press and the advisory board of MEET. And in addition, he is an accomplished photographer and his current project is called Portraits of Resilience which is a series of images and stories about how people in the MIT community who have overcome depression and related challenges um, have succeeded. And it's now available as a book from the MIT Press. So welcome everybody. Sorry, I just talked at, at everybody a lot. Um, so I think we're going to jump into the questions that we have for the panelists. And my first set of questions are just open to anybody, sort of popcorn style. If you feel moved to answer or comment, feel free. And then later I have some specific questions 
for you based on um, your different experiences and expertise areas. So I thought that to start us off, something that I think is important to kind of just define is the difference between being empathetic and being emotional. Because I think talking, I think that those terms can get confused a lot. And I remember when I was growing up being taught about the difference between empathy and sympathy. Um, but I think being empathetic, oftentimes people confuse with just being emotional or having kind of an emotional response to the thing. Any of you wants to, you know, define empathy and kind of what's for our purposes today so that we kind of know um, going forward when we use these terms, what we mean by that. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and say a little about the difference between emotions and having empathy. Um, well, any of us, we all have emotions, right? We feel angry, we feel sad. Something will happen to me, I might feel angry, right? Something might happen to someone else, I might observe it, I might not feel anything, I might not know how they're feeling. So this is mostly when I say I'm emotional, it means this is me, it's all about me, I, and what is happening in rooms to me. When I think when I'm empathetic, it means I try to imagine what other people are going through. I try to understand why people feel a certain way. I try to put myself in other people's shoes. So something might happen, like someone in your life might be a horrible person, right? I might feel anger towards them. I might feel sad that this is happening to me. But when I'm being em empathetic, it means I try to feel why are they doing what they're doing? What are they feeling? Was it that they were hurt growing up? Was it that they were feeling ashamed of something? So they were acting a certain way? So they were angry? It doesn't mean I have to be okay with it. It doesn't mean I have to accept it. It just means I try to understand where people are coming from. Got it. Okay, thanks. That, that's actually, actually really helpful. So empathy is sort of trying to imagine what someone else's emotions might be versus, yes. versus emoting yourself and just feeling the ones that you feel. Yeah, I mean, a part of empathy would be how you respond to those emotions, um, but it's, it's somehow the, the response a part of that empathy process. Great. And so my next question to, to the group is, connecting what we just talked about to the, the title of this panel, um, which is asking about how empathy can be used to facilitate communication. Um, we often talk about communication as being a one-way street, or sorry, a two-way street, not one way, a two-way street. But often I think when people are working in the sciences, a lot of the communication that, that we do is one way. It's, I have information and I'm trying to communicate that to someone, whether through a paper that I'm writing or a talk that I'm giving. Um, and there is a sense that it's very one directional, um, but with empathy that is, it's more of a two direct directional thing. So my question is how can um, using empathy make us better communicators and try to turn that one way street into a, a two way street? Um, I, can I just jump in? Yeah, please. Yeah, so it seems to me that the most important thing about empathy is caring. I think of emotion as having to do with feeling, but empathy is having to do with caring. And if you're caring, then you're not just caring about the issue or caring that you're clear about the issue, that you're explaining it correctly, kind of like you're filling in some information that the other person doesn't have, but you're caring whether they understand it and you're caring how they're responding to it. So it seems to me that if, if what you're actually trying to do is to communicate, it's important to be empathetic because you have to assess, you have to care about whether the person who's listening to your message understands it, how they're responding, how they're feeling, whether they actually get it. Otherwise, you run into one of these situations where, as you said, somebody's just talking at somebody else and it's not even about the other person. It's kind of like I'm saying the truth and if you don't believe it, who cares? That's not empathetic, that's not caring. If you really wanna communicate, you have to care whether the person is understanding you. Can I, can I add something to that? I, I think that's excellent. I, I would add to that that this doesn't mean that in every single you know, occasion on which you, you, know, you give a talk or you write a piece, it has to be two way. 
of course, you hope it will be two way because you hope people will respond. But what it really means is that you have to have adopted an empathetic posture throughout your career so that when you come to explain something, you do it with an understanding of your audience and with an engagement of your audience. So you do it, you're do, essentially, every communication you make is in community. So in exactly the same way that when you say something in a group, you might not be listening as you talk to what people are saying because you have to get to the end of your sentence. Maybe if you're delivering a paper, it's a whole paper you're gonna get to the end of, but you won't do a good job of delivering that paper unless you understand the emotional context in which you're presenting it. And, and one of the things that I discovered, it took me a long time to figure this out in teaching, is that actually nobody really cares about, in some sense, no one really cares about abstract ideas. Um, that that the, the idea that teaching, particularly in the sciences or mathematics or technology or engineering, is about explaining meticulously how an I, you know, the, the, the sort of a logical, you know, construction of an idea is sort of guaranteed to be a catastrophe pedagogically. Um, and that actually, we are human beings and all we want is stories. Everybody needs a story. And so if you don't explain to somebody why they should care about your idea, why it, why it should matter to them, why it should matter to the world, in some sense, it doesn't matter how big an idea it is, because the the significance of the idea is 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 in its uh, is in its value and purpose to the individual. Thank you. That's that's really cool. Uh, you mentioned just now, um, Daniel, sort of adopting an empathetic posture um, rather than necessarily turning every type of communication into a, a so-called two-way street. Um, what does having that kind of an empathetic empathetic posture look like you know how how does one use empathy when communicating in all of these different scientific ways so if anybody has specific examples that they can give or um some tactics that they can use or or attitudes that they take to ensure that they are um having that posture of empathy um I, I usually have this rule that if you can't be empathetic, don't try to pretend that you're empathetic. Just make sure you're actually caring. Make sure that you're actually trying to be empathetic because people, people smell condescension. People can feel that someone is being pitiful. People can feel someone is feeling like, oh, I'm doing this because I'm so good that I'm showing care. So I think it's important to actually be empathetic in the first place, realizing that we're both humans and I need to know where you're from because this is a journey that we're going on together. This is something also about the hierarchies that exist. So for example, if I feel like I'm a scientist and there's someone else who is not a scientist and I'm going to be empathetic because I know more and I'm going to hold their hand and take them somewhere, right? So realizing that it's not a hierarchy. I'm an expert in my field. Someone else that might not be in academia is an expert in their field. And I'm not taking their hand, go, taking them somewhere. We're together taking each other's hands and are going somewhere to this goal that is going to benefit both of us. And we can only do that if we both try to understand each other's feelings and care for each other. Um, and that goal is not something that I am giving other people a benefit. It's a goal that is going to benefit all of us. So I would say like that posture starts with realizing why we're being empathetic and what is our position in that empathy. I, th I think that's wonderful. Um, it reminds me of, 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 of the idea uh, that Parker Palmer talks about, which I think is probably the, the idea that has had most influence on the way I think about teaching, which is that he says that um, the worst kind of teaching, and I, I used to do this a lot, is where you essentially put on a performance. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you think of yourself, you're in an auditorium and you're trying to entertain and excite and all that kind of stuff. And his observation is <clears throat> that the very best teachers, that the way they actually connect with their audiences is that they share their inner life in some sense. And if you can actually share your humanity with your audience, you can get a very much deeper level of engagement because you know, there's, there's a real sharing of ideas and a real sharing of, of purpose. Uh, and while you're performing, you might as well just be you know, playing a movie. I, I, I wanted to jump in on the question of, um, Lindsay, you'd asked about the two-way street. And uh, can people hear me? Uh, or, okay, uh, it, it seemed to me that uh, I want to be careful of the notion of a, a two-way street. 
because I think it's possible to be empathetic, even if it's a one-way street. That is, it's possible to be empathetic even if you're the expert and you're sharing information that the other person needs to hear. It's kind of a matter of how you do it. Now, and the reason I'm somewhat worried about the, uh, the model of empathy being the same as it being a, a, a two-way dialogue is what do you do when you've got people who are uh, resisting the message? Um, I work, uh, a lot of my research is on science deniers. And when you're talking to somebody who's a science denier, um, they're gonna resist you know, what you have to say, uh, even if they're not an expert, even if they don't know what they're talking about. And I just wanna be very careful that it doesn't, that, that we're not in saying that we need empathy, making it sound like uh, we need some sort of consensus because you know, ab ab absolutely not. Um, sometimes, but that's not to say that empathy isn't important though. If you look at some of the literature, even some of the anecdotes about the ways to convince people, say who are anti-vaxxers, empathy is really the only thing that works. You do need to be empathetic. You do need to listen to their fears and their concerns. You need to let them uh, express themselves. But I think the, the important thing is never to Lee, you froze. That there, there are actual right and wrong answers. Sorry, Lee, could you just repeat that last part that you said you froze for about 10 seconds? Yeah, we what, that. what I want to say is that um, I, I don't want to ever uh, seed the idea uh, when talking to an anti-vaxxer, say, or other science deniers, that there's such a thing as a right or wrong answer. Uh, I, I just, uh, I, I get, I am concerned that um, the empathy not be read as a kind of uh, way of seeking consensus, because that's not how it works with scientific topics. If we're not all scientists and we don't, uh, you know, we're not all doing the same sorts of experiments. Sometimes science communication is we're telling people what we found. We need to do it in an empathetic way. We need to understand maybe why they don't understand it uh, and, and empathize with that. But it's not, um, th the reason I bring this up is because I've had so many interactions with science deniers who seem to feel that um, I talk, they talk, it's an equal amount of time, and then maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. That's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not actual that's not good science communication i think to let somebody get that sort of impression mm -hmm. and what you're saying kind of brings to mind something that i have heard around the scientific community really for the last few years which is that you can't change someone's mind with facts and we have seen this play out over and over is that when you present people with you know scientific facts and numbers um that doesn't seem to work and people seem to feel that they can just ignore that or they can come up with different arguments to support the idea that they you know they're, they're choosing not to believe in facts um and and that facts are things that somehow can now be believed in um or not believed in which i think is an interesting development and so what do you do if you are in that scenario where you're speaking with someone who does not believe in what you're trying to say and how do you empathize with a person like that but without maybe as lee was suggesting without giving them the impression that because you empathize with them you agree with them or because you care about what they feel that you are implicitly supportive of what they feel. How do you kind of walk that tightrope? I, I uh, can think of a, sorry, go ahead, please. No, please. Uh, I, I can think of an example. So I was doing this study at a planetarium where the, there is all the, all the public and there's different scientists having conversations with the public. And the public comes in and out, um, and they, it's mainly based on conversations. And um, at some point, this group of students come in uh, with their teacher. And the scientist is talking about um, galaxies and different um, black holes and the age of these black holes and how they're millions of years old, right? Um, and then the teacher says, I'm sorry, 
we are from a young earth creationist school. Would it be okay if you don't, please, like we don't talk about, this, this is not what we think. We don't think the universe is this many years old. Um, can you talk about something else? Um, so the scientist freezes for a second and then she thinks about it uh, and she says, okay, let's talk about these cool galaxies. And then she starts putting up some pictures of galaxies and they're awesome and all the kids get excited and they start asking about galaxies. And it's a whole one hour conversation about how cool these galaxies are and how they're made. And before leaving, the teacher goes to the scientist and says, thank you so much. Um, this was really fun. I think as, as Lee and as Daniel said, empathy is so much about listening and reflecting that you're listening. The whole, this is not a conversation about persuasion. This is not a conversation about behavior change, attitude change. This is a conversation about empathy and how it looks. And it, even though as science communicators, we have this final goal, probably, even if we try to deny it, which is probably changing someone's attitude about science, changing someone's behavior about science. And when we have the mindset of, I want to change someone's attitude right now, and I want to persuade them right now, then the behaviors that we have is that behavior of pushing of like, no, the universe is this many years old. These are the facts. These are the truth. What the scientist did was that she, she prioritized empathy and having a conversation and leaving these doors open for this extended conversation that maybe at some point might lead to an attitude change or behavior change, right? What's happening is that these students might probably come back to the planetarium. Next time they're going to see a scientist, they might think like, you know, some of them are nice. Some of them you can have a conversation with. But if she would have acted otherwise, which would be unempathetic, then none of these would have happened, right? Um, so I, I think there is something to that way of like managing those conversations where you have to sometimes make sacrifices for some conversation in future where you might actually discuss something that is more related to that topic. You, you, you said a very important thing there that, that um, is borne out in the research, which is that I mean, I think that people can change their minds based on facts, but the context in which the facts are presented is very important. Um, people respond to warmth. Uh, they need to trust the person who's communicating. So what I like about your story is that the teacher um, built a relationship with the students. And then you're right, then they can come back uh, later at some point. It's not as if you have to bulldoze somebody at that very second with you know everything that's the facts and you know cram it down their throat otherwise you've lost um so what i like about that is that it's it's a story about how to recognize that sometimes when people are resisting scientific facts it's because they don't trust the person who's communicating them so building that trust is a is a primary goal but it it, it does have to be part of a longer conversation though so that you know, you're hoping that the person will come back because um, it's, I mean, I'm out there having these kinds of conversations all the time. Uh, sometimes it feels like a hit and run and you know, you wonder what, what can I do? But I, I think it's always beneficial to recognize that if you treat the other per person with respect, warmth, then they'll begin to trust you and they may end up changing their mind. So we, we have to sort of play the long game and yet, um, facts do work. Uh, I don't think we need to give up on that because there are uh, experiments which show you know, that people do change their mind based on facts. Can I, can I add to this, uh, this idea that, that Lee and Ray have raised of sort of uh, um, empathizing with your interlocutor? You know, I think one of the things that we have to be careful about is not necessarily assuming that facts are actually the issue at stake. So, you know, it's possible. So if somebody put up their hand at, you know, this planetarium event and said, you're wrong, you know, the, you know, the universe is not, you know, is not more than 5,000 years old. That's one thing. But if the teacher says, you know, I'd rather you didn't talk about this, you might ask yourself, why is the teacher saying that? And what is the teacher actually saying? It's possible. I mean, and just, just, just to fantasize for a minute, it's possible that this teacher is from a fundamentalist school and wants to inculcate the children with scientific knowledge and, and has gone out on a limb to take these children to an event which is already putting her or his career at risk in some way um, and has decided that they only want the information to go so far for, for perhaps extremely uh, reasonable tactical reasons. 
Uh, and so if you, if you engage at the, at the sort of surface level of the fact, you might be completely misunderstanding the subcontext, um, which is actually what's really going on in the conversation. Yeah, that's, that's a great point too, is that you never really know where another person is coming from. And so any, any time you interact with someone, you are implicitly making assumptions about, you know, who they are and what they care about. And unless you want to delve really deeply into someone's psyche and understand why the way you are or why they are the way that they are, you know, it seems like the best approach is just assume nothing um, and just treat the person with respect and meet them where they are, I think is, is kind of one of the biggest things that I've been hearing about um, in this conversation and other places too. Well, and the other possibility is to ask them, you know, what they think, to ask them questions. I mean, one of the things, you know, that actually came up again and again in Portraits of Resilience in my book, talking to people, was how many people said that they found great um, consolation and encouragement in religious ideas and how offended they were that at MIT, you know, it was assumed that because they had some kind of religious belief that they had some dogmatic fundamentalist, you know, um, theological, um, you know, um, uh, faith commitment that in fact was not reflective of their, of their religious position, but that was what they were characterized as having. And so the conversation never went beyond that. Yeah. Um, and something just building up off of, um, I think when we were all mentioning that you can have empathy in a one way conversation and how can you show this, I think something interesting is that um, when we talk about empathy, we a lot of times I personally when I was studying eng engagement, it was always about having a face to face conversation showing my empathy and there's all these examples with us as science communicators as scientists, we write papers, we produce videos and a lot of them actually don't have any real face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and again, with something that we we're just talking about with these values that people have. So how can we show our empathy when we're actually having a one-way conversation, right? Um, and the same things work, like I'm looking at David's comment that when we frame things and into context of people's values, right? So if I'm making a film, for example, there's a film about vaccination that Sunia Pemberton made. And I really enjoy how she's showing empathy without having an actual conversation. And in some parts, she has the royal homeopath about vaccination and talk about, you know, different topics in the film. And as someone that is watching, if I think that, oh, if it's only scientific, they're not gonna bring in homeopath. It's too scientific. This is not talking to me. But if I'm a person that believes in alternative medicines, which might be also a part of my process as being vaccine hesitant. When I see someone that is a homeopath, the royal homeopath, as a part of the experts on the show, then you're kind of showing me your empathy. You're kind of showing me that I'm framing all of my conversations with your values, with your concerns, with the thoughts that you have, with the examples that you're constantly reading on the internet. So it's also interesting to see how you have to, we have to manage that empathy when we're actually in a one-way conversation, which were brought up by a lot of you. Great, thank you. Um, I have one question that is sort of to the group, and then I have specific questions that are aimed at one of the panelists in particular, but those are also open to other people if you want to you know, jump your own. Um, comment or or um, or thought after that. So the last group that I have is has to do with um, the idea that in the scientific community, um, in general, I think that empathizing with other people and prioritizing conversation is not necessarily done. <laughs> I think that there is a sense in which you know, we are scientists, we prioritize facts and statistics and showing care to other people or caring about what other people think about your work isn't necessarily something that I've seen taught deliberately, or it's not something that I think a lot of scientists that I've interacted with prioritize. And it's not that they don't care, you know, about their students or about their work or that their work is interpreted correctly. They do care about that. But I think there is this perception um, among scientific um, professionals and, and students is that I can't be 
I can't be shown to be caring too much or else people won't take me seriously. You know, if I, if I take the time to make sure that my talk is understandable to a broader audience, then that will be, rather than me being respected for taking my audience into account, that will be as me being lists or because I choose not to use the big words that are jargony that indicate, you know, that I am very familiar with the field. If I don't use those big words, I will be less respected. Um, and sort of, there seems to be a little bit of trepidation around the idea of showing or, or prioritizing um, care beyond, you know, just getting the message across. So my question related to that is, why do we think that this dichotomy exists and and does it need to um and how can and you know within the context of the scientific enterprise in which we find ourselves how can how can a grad student or a postdoc or or a scientist do that and and express empathy in a way that doesn't that they don't perceive to be jeopardizing their career i guess I'd say it depends on the audience. If you're, if a scientist is communicating with a scientific audience, it, it might be a, a different kettle of fish. But if you're, if you're communicating with a, uh, with a lay audience, it, it's really important to understand. Um, scientists are dyed in the wool to understand that you change your beliefs based on facts, experiment, logic, testing. But that's not the way that everybody in the world decides what to believe. And if you're talking with an audience who isn't, doesn't already share the value, uh, doesn't already have the understanding that if the facts change, I change my mind, or you know, this was a definitive experiment, so I should give up my belief, then you've really got to go some way to meet them where they are and help them to understand that. I mean, one, one thing that I've been shock to find as I've been out in my travels talking with science deniers is that for the most part um, a, a big revelation was that an awful lot of their belief is based on their identity it's based on their values it's not based on the facts I went to the uh, flat earth convention out in Denver two years ago they're not making up their mind based on the facts how could they be but they'll tell you that they're uh, doing experiments that they're basing it on evidence. It takes a while to listen to them to figure out that these beliefs are very personal to them. It's part of their identity. When you attack the belief, you're attacking them as a person. So in trying to communicate with them, I had to stop trying to share facts and evidence because they, the facts and evidence had been around for 2,300 years and they weren't convinced by it. What I had to do was, um, with respect, uh, ask them about their beliefs, ask them about their lives, get them to talk about themselves, begin to try to pierce the identity that was keeping them from making their mind up uh, based on facts, which is very, very hard work to do, especially at a, at a conference like that where they've got all this peer support of other uh, uh, flat earthers. But what I found is that if you can disarm them with um, not just making the assumption that, well, you know, unless you're an idiot, you make up your mind based on the facts, but instead ask them how they came to form their belief, you can actually get some way at least to building some kind of preliminary basis in trust. Um, I might add a little bit on the other side of this. So as someone that has just defended a dissertation and was in academia very recently, I, when I started the first year, I went to the first um, brown bag session and I listened and I was like, oh my God, am I dumb? I, like I was so lost listening to this very fancy presentation about something that was full of jargons and I couldn't understand and all the imposter syndrome kicked in and I was like, I, I, like, I thought I'm doing the PhD so I'm like, I probably have like a level of smart that is okay and I should understand these things and then I started realizing that in order for me to fit in and show my status as a student I have to use the same language and I have to bring in all this jargon and talk about my fancy stat and my model and this algorithms and all these things that I'm using and the more I started getting to understand the whole concept of science communication and the research behind it 
and the importance of using empathy and showing care and pick, taking all the jargon out of your conversation and using stories, then I started realizing that, oh, like the, if I want to be effective and a good scientist, I need this as a part of my package, right? And then you start seeing the history of all of that. So you think of Carl Sagan, right? Carl Sagan was a scientist, an amazing scientist, but he had so much care and so much heart, right? And in his own community, he was also a science communicator. But in his own community, um, people started referring to an effect called the Carl Sagan effect, which means even though you have a lot of amazing academic accomplishment, people perceive you to be less scientific and less academic because you're showing all the science communication, empathy and care. So I think something to understand is that there is a norm. You're absolutely right, Lindsay. There is this whole idea of like, oh, if you're like more caring and empathetic and have all these feelings and psychom, you're less of a scientist and less of an academic. So I think our responsibility is to change the norm. As we are seeing right now, we have more research methods that are, you know, community based, that include the people that are being affected by our research. If we didn't have any empathy or if we didn't have any care, then how do we know which communities we're, you know, um, serving? What is the implications of the research that we're having? Who is it going to affect? How is it going to affect them? Why are there is why is there so many communities that are left out from the ways we're collecting data and we're analyzing data and we're presenting the data, right? So I think there's an argument to this this soul, this caring, this empathy, this psychom methods. That's what makes science better. And if you want to use pick the language of scientists, we probably need to show them also data, right? To show all these effects of good science communication. It seems to me that this is this is fascinating. That but we're mixing a number of different issues. There's a question of empathy, which you talked about very eloquently, Ray. Um, but this question of scientific communication, I think, has another aspect to it, which is that we all seek to do our work in the most, let's say, efficient way. And efficient often means the most lazy way. And so if you're a scientist trying to evaluate another scientist, it's much easier to try and check whether they use the right words than to evaluate their ideas, because that's much harder to understand. And if you're a scientist trying to give a talk, it's much easier to use long words than to explain your ideas. And so the most common failing I see in people's presentations is they don't actually explain their ideas deeply, because that's much, much too hard to do. And it takes a huge amount of work. Um, and people are normally insecure, so they don't want to expose themselves to that level of scrutiny. So it's much easier to sort of rely on all the given notions in your field and to use all the long words and to sort of intimate in a vague way what the actual idea is. You know, that's why people will often show a lot of formulas rather than explaining an idea properly. Um, but I think in the long term, if you actually want to have impact and you want to be truly respected, then you actually need to do the hard work of trying to figure out what your ideas really mean. Um, and you need to find a way to explain them. And then that really pays off big time if you put in that effort. Great, thank you. Ray's uh, comments made me remember a um, seminar that I saw recently that was that's related to this, where they interviewed several, I think, from different states around middle America. And they th I think they were all corn farmers, you know, big industrial corn and soybean farmers. And the film producers asked them first, what do you think about climate change? And every single one of these farmers just said, you know, what you would expect of maybe people in that area. They said, nope, it's not real. It's a hoax. It's made up by the government. You know, I don't believe it. Very, very combative. Um, you know, clearly that touched a nerve in them and they just, you know, wouldn't even consider it. And then the producers asked the exact same people, how have changes in the weather in the last 10 years affected your farming. And the exact same people changed their demeanor completely. And they started saying things like, oh yeah, the weather has been changing. It's been bad. I've lost X number of crops. The pests are up, you know, the seeds are expensive. Yeah, it's a real problem. Um, and I thought it was really interesting how the exact same people asked essentially the same thing, but just in different terms, you know, one that was, you know, asking for their opinion on an issue that was clearly very emotionally charged and that, you know, it, in their view, challenged a belief system 
um, versus an empathetic approach of, well, tell me how this affects you and, and your life and, and your concerns. Um, I thought was really, it was really powerful. So I always think about that when, um, when considering how we can have empathy um, when talking about these topics. But Lindsay, I wonder, that's a fascinating example. I wonder if the farmers are actually that unconscious, you know, of, of the implications of climate change. Perhaps both of them are deeply personal issues to them. And um, when they think about climate change, they think about national uh, the national policies, they think about you know, global agreements, they think about political parties. They have a very, very clear understanding of the implications of what it means to sign up to a climate change agenda. Um, and for whatever reason, they've come to the conclusion, perhaps influenced you know, largely by some nefarious activities by politicians, you know, that it's not in their interest to sign up for that agenda. But when you ask them about, you know, whether whether the weather has changed, then they're perfectly willing to admit that. So, you know, they they act like the rest of us, which is the, you know, it's it's I think what you know Lee was saying earlier about people having identities. They they have very clear identities and they know where their values stand. And so actually they might be, you know, they, they might be ill-informed. You know, it could be the case that those, you know, those global agreements would actually benefit them. But it might not be the case. It might be the case that actually you know, they're benefiting from, you know, from the short term um, political um, agenda of, of the party that they've aligned themselves with. Yeah. They don't, they don't call it denial for nothing either. It's what I'm thinking, right? There's some level at which they know and some level at which they really don't know because they won't accept it because it conflicts with their identity. Yeah, it's entirely possible. Um, and Lee, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you talking for a second because <laughs> we're we need to go into the uh, the panel of specific questions because I realize we want to leave some time at the end. Um, so one of your books is called The Scientific Attitude, um, and as the title might suggest, um, in it you argue that our society needs to adopt what you call a scientific attitude, which is the willingness to hear what the evidence tells us, even if it clashes with religious or political beliefs, and then apply our findings to create a better society, which sounds great, and I'm, I'm all on board with that, but I also know that as we've been talking about, religious and political beliefs are often deeply emotional for people because they're tied up in questions of identity pretty often. Um, so how difficult or easy do you think it would be to actually achieve that you know what do we need to do to make it so that people even though they have these very strong emotional reactions to things that they see as challenging these beliefs are able to sort of put that aside and then still go forward with what the facts are telling them to do yeah there are two things first um the scientific attitude i see as a model it's something that scientists embody something that scientists embrace this idea that you care about evidence and that you're willing to change your mind on the basis of new evidence that's a that's a set of values that's an ethos um, and scientists hold one another to it it's not just a matter of individual commitment but it's this shared ethos where scientists test one another's work and keep one another honest even if they're honest in the first place now you ask a very good question about how to apply that outside science, how to get other people to uh, embrace those values. And I think that one way is when they see their own interests at stake. Um, it's one thing to be an anti-vaxxer um, in a community where there's herd immunity and you really don't have to worry about it. It's another thing to be an anti-vaxxer in the time of coronavirus. I've been reading recently that the coronavirus outbreak has been bringing some anti-vaxxers into the vaccine camp, that it's been uh, changing some minds. So I think that one thing that happens is when people's specific interests are at stake, then all of a sudden they realize that these values that science embraces uh, are quite important. I think you'd see the same thing <coughs> with the corn farmers. Uh, you see the same thing with uh, people who have waterfront pro uh, property, uh, who are uh, climate change deniers. All of a sudden, when things get real for people, and it's not just a matter of some abstract political identity, but maybe something that affects their 
uh, their health or maybe something that affects their uh, personal economics, uh, it, can, it can begin to make a difference for them. Um, I, I sort of wish that, I, I don't know how to do that work uh, on a societal basis, uh, you know, the, the, the global way that, that you're talking about. Uh, what I'm much more tuned in these days with the new book that I'm writing is face-to-face -face individual conversations with science deniers. But maybe it's the same thing. Maybe it's this idea that you have to open a dialogue with people, that, that partisanship, uh, getting information in our different silos and just yelling at each other isn't working. And what we need to do is recognize that really the, the basic distinction here, although scientists sometimes get squirrely when they hear me say it this way, is one of values because the scientific attitude is a value. And I think that one reason that we've misunderstood, even scientists have misunderstood what science is about, is because they haven't accepted the idea that really what makes it distinctive is not a logic or a method, it's the value of caring about evidence. That, that's really important, I think, to understand what science is is to understand that they care about evidence. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump in or add to that? No? OK. Uh, my next question is going to be for Daniel, um, which is about your Portraits of Resilience project, which I think is super interesting. And it was. Uh, from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, um, a response to a relatively dark period in MIT's recent history, which was in 2015, where there were um, a series of suicides on campus in a pretty short period of time. Um, and a lot of people were asking why and were trying to process that and trying to figure out, is there something about um, our culture that is preventing these people from getting the help they need? Is it, um, is there something that's missing? Are they not feeling like they are supportive and that people are, you know, people care about them? Um, so I'm curious to know um, sort of what moved you to create this photography project and kind of what, um, what your thought process was through, through that. Oh, well, you know, a lot of us, I think at the time, you know, faculty, students, administrators, staff, everybody was thinking about how we were going to deal with this epidemic of suicide. It was just, it was a terrible time. Um, we were all trying to think about small things that we could do. And this was my own small project. I think it came out of a number of observations. One, the main observation was that MIT has a kind of cult of anonymity um, in which, you know, we, 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 it's almost like we have a kind of, um, I would say, a libertarian geek philosophy that pervades the campus um, where people think that, you know, privacy is a, a value above almost all other values that, and so we have a very, um, we have a lot of barriers to sort of sharing. Uh, and so all discussions of mental health basically have, have been, had been sort of sublimated and pushed under the surface. And furthermore, any discussions we'd had have been sort of medicalized in terms of, you know, um, scientific questions about mental illness. Um, you know, which is often not much consolation to someone who's suffering, you know, the trauma of depression or whatever. And the other thing that, that, that I was thinking was that, you know, whenever the topic of mental health came up, it was always the so-called experts who was talking about it, you know, the doctors, the therapists, you know, the, the, the health policy people, and never those people had actually had the experiences themselves. And so I wanted basically to put together a collection of portraits and stories of people who could actually talk about their own experiences and basically provide the, the wisdom that they had experienced in, uh, in, you know, um, in coming to terms with real adversity um, that I thought would be, you know, would, be, would be valuable to all of us and you know, whether we'd had those experiences or not. And it turned out to be quite extraordinary what wisdom these people had. So that, that was sort of what motivated it. Mm -hmm. And what has been, um what has been the the most rewarding part of that for you and are there were there any kind of unexpected um responses or or things that happened as a result of of that project whether it was from the people who shared with you yeah. or anything else like that sure well the most um let's see i guess the most wonderful thing was meeting these incredible people and just hearing about the diversity of their experiences and their extraordinary insights that was amazing 
um, coming to realize how deeply problematic our culture is and how many of the problems that we face in mental health are exacerbated or maybe even caused by the kind of um, the kind of competitiveness and the kinds of attitudes we take, the lack of empathy, if you like, that we've been talking about in this panel, um, the fact that we try and imagine that we're all pursuing some kind of abstract activity without people involved, um, and that we that we increasingly value ourselves by all these sort of um, shallow numerical transient proxies like your GPA or your salary or things like that, your rewards, and we don't value the whole person. And we have this hyper competitive culture in which, you know, kids are like tweaking their resumes from their teenage years onwards. Uh, and in short, it's killing us. Um, and I think it's creating an enormous amount of unhappiness. So for me, that's been, um, that's been the, the big learning for, for me, that and strategies that people have for how to, how to overcome that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I'm actually going to deviate just a little bit from the plan because there is a question that came in through the chat that I think is very relevant to kind of what we're talking about. So I'm gonna pose that first and kind of anybody can answer it. And then Ray, I'll get to the, the last question that I wanted to ask you before getting to the rest of the chat submitted questions. So this question um, from one of the audience members is asking, what is the best way to explain the value of empathy to other scientists who seem to look down on or dismiss people's values and ideas or not value them at all? Kind of, and the reason I'm linking these, these two together is talking about this, this lack of empathy and kind of what Daniel was talking about is this idea that we are engaged in this pursuit that is that is intellectual and abstract and somehow forgetting the fact that we're all people um, and that empathy actually is important. So if someone, if you're dealing with someone who is of that mindset that is frivolous and you know it's all about the work, how can you communicate to them that empathy actually is important? Oh, I can say very simply, it's, I think you know, we have this hero model of scientific achievement, which is a complete fantasy. It's almost never been the case that any the great scientific, technological, philosophical discoveries in any field that, you know, they're almost never just, you know, the, the product of an individual working alone. That's incredibly rare. Uh, almost all great things that people do are a result of their reliance and interdependence on others. And so if you don't nurture that interdependence, you'll never have a hope of making big, you know, having big achievements. I mean, that's a very instrumentalist way of looking at it but it's one way I might argue to someone if they only care about the end of being, you know, famous and successful and producing great science, then, um, you know, the, the means to an end is going to have to go through working with other people and being dependent on them. I think there's something very meta about this because uh, we are like communicating to scientists the importance of like empathy. And you would think that like, oh, scientists, we should be so open to everything the same way that like they talk about the public having to be open to things. But then there is this thing called empathy and it's been working for thousands of years. And now you have to communicate it to scientists and they're like, there's like so many defense, so much defensiveness. So the same principles that we have in science communication, we have to apply in communicating that to the scientists, right? So see what are the languages they're most comfortable with? Data, show them data about empathy, right? Um, anecdotes of a lot of times that we use, you know, empathy in communicating, for example, the science of vaccination, climate change, and how they worked, telling stories, using, having constant conversation, and the same way, being empathetic to the scientists that are a little against empathy, right, and figuring out where they're coming from. What, are they worried about being seen as caring? Are they worried about, mm, you know, losing the interest of their, you know, like, I don't know, their advisors, because their advisors might be like, oh, you can like, you know, constantly go out and talk to people about different things. What, where are they coming from? And then I'm going to go back to all the things that we all talked about, about empathy, right? So being able to be listening, understanding why people might not want to be empathetic, giving them time and continuing these conversations, helping them change the norms, removing some of those barriers so that they can become empathetic. For example, if we know offices in our universities and places that um, could have outreach opportunities, 
provide them. So I sometimes talk to like, when I was working at the planetarium, a lot of scientists would be like, you know, um, I had to have conversation with the public because the NSF made me do it as a part of my broader impact. But when I did it, the joy that I got from having conversations and hearing out people, that reminded me how much I enjoyed it. So even providing opportunities so that they can experience why empathy matters, right? So there's all these different things that we could do that is, goes into the whole list of SciComm that we do for other people. Great, thank you. Um, and so my last question, again, sorry, everybody, I'm gonna keep you talking, um, is something that you mentioned and also that Daniel mentioned earlier is the importance of, of storytelling. I think Daniel said something like, people just want stories. I know that you have been involved Story Collider, um, which for those of you who don't know, is something like, it's similar to The Moth, which is live people telling stories, but with Story Collider, they all are about science or talks given by scientists, there's sort of a scientific angle there. So I'm curious to find out um, what is it about telling stories that makes them so much more powerful and resonant than simply, you know, a list of facts or a series of events and how um, putting things in the context of stories can actually um, maybe bring out some of that empathy or express some of that empathy that we've been talking about trying to, to cultivate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, there's a lot of studies that shows the effect of storytelling, right? Not obviously any story, but there are some stories that help you transport, right? Like when you're reading something and you're so in it and you're so paying attention that even if something happens around you, you're not you're like, oh, I feel like I'm in another universe. That's that transportation. And that transportation help us like lower our defense mechanism, read things that otherwise we might not listen to. Uh, but what I think I care the most about with stories is that I think stories are curious and make us curious. And when we're more curious, we get to that why, that really deep why, and that makes us more empathetic. So if I hear, um, I broke that bike, right? My reaction is like, oh, you broke a bi bike, you must be a horrible person. But when it's a story, it's not just I broke a bike. It's, it goes with, why did you broke a bike? Because I was angry. Why were you angry? Because this guy has this bike who is really, that's like really nice and fancy and their parents bought it for him. Well, why does that make you angry? Well, because I never had a very fancy bike. I had to work all the time growing up so that I can buy something that I could like and it's a little fancy. So what happens is that when you tell stories, you take people to that why, why, why and you take them so far back then it, that it helps you make, become more empathetic which is why when we're helping or like when we're working with our storytellers, we really get them to get to that why. We don't let them just say something like, oh, I got angry and I did that, or I said that. You always are like, why did you say that? What is your thought process? And that helps people connect. And I think that's what matters a lot about stories. It transports us, it's full of feelings, and it gets to that empathetic why. That's great, thank you. Anybody else wanna chime in on that? I, I, that was wonderful. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, so I have one question that I would like to um, post to the group from the chat. And then for the last couple minutes, if people are willing to stay a little bit longer, I'm happy to take live questions um, if anybody wants to ask them directly to the panelists. And the question is, um, somebody asked to learn about um, sort of mechanisms that you can give uh, to avoid the pitfalls of being perceived by an audience as patronizing um, when in reality you're attempting to empathize with them. So how can you empathize without making it seem like you are dumbing something down to someone's level? Can I, can I say something about that? I think, I think there are two different things. First, I think there's the emotional posture you take towards your audience. And I, I don't think anyone, whole, you know, uh, regards it as bad to have to create an emotional connection with your audience. You know, that's, that's a skill to be developed and, and the audience appreciates it and it produces a better interaction. I think what's behind this question is, you know, is, the, is, a, is a second thing, which is what happens if in trying to make things simpler and connect them to your audience, you're perceived as, as somehow insulting their intelligence? Um, and I think the answer to that, at least in my own experience, is quite simple, which is, are you actually um, simplifying away real issues or you're really getting to the core of it. 
Because if what you're actually doing is explaining the key idea in simple terms, um, then that's probably quite an intellectual achievement. And that tends to be, that tends, um, you know, in the right scientific circles with people, I think, who have sort of good taste and, uh, and scientific maturity, that tends to be rewarded. You know, when, when Einstein wrote his little book about special relativity, you know, that didn't require any calculus, you know, I think people were, were just amazed by it. They thought, you know, his scientific colleagues thought, wow, this is fantastic, because there was no dumbing down. It was like explaining this fundamental idea in the most simple terms, and it showed how deep his understanding was. So I would say it's having enough respect for your audience so you're not trying to pull a fast one on them. You're actually trying to work hard at coming up with a really uh, deep explanation that is deeply understandable and deeply simple. And that, in some, in, that some, in some sense, that is the entire, you know, aim of scientific explanation anyway, finding more simple, cogent explanations that are faithful to the facts. And very hard to do. Very hard. Something a filmmaker taught me was have a post-it and write on it, I might be wrong, and leave it next to you. And I think when we become empathetic and want to have conversations, even though we, we try to be open, we actually already made up our minds that vaccines are great. And I'm going to have a conversation with you to do that, even if you're trying to be open. And it's extremely hard, but I think it's an important practice to be like, what if I'm wrong? And I think that would help that conversation actually get a feel of like, no, this is really a conversation. And I really want to know where you're coming from. That, that's that's actually a, a key to talking to somebody who disagrees on a scientific topic because I think that it's one of the myths of science that uh, it's about proof and certainty. And uh, that's, that's something that science deniers use a lot to say, well, you know, can you prove that climate change is real? Can you prove this? Can you prove that? And until the day that you can, they think that their uh, other theory is just as likely to be true. So I, it is actually very important to be able to own the idea of scientific uncertainty and not see it, for scientists not to see it as a, um, a bad thing or to sort of cheat a little and pretend that they've proven something when they haven't because that's a bad luck uh, when you get caught on that. So just to be able to own the idea of uncertainty but to be very genuine and straightforward about it. To say, well, no, we can't prove it because it's not deductive logic but here's the evidence and it's overwhelmingly likely to be true and you know, share it in that way. I think people find that uh, honest and a little more compelling. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I would like to, if anybody wants to ask the panelists a question um, now live, if you'd like to do that, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. And if you don't want, if no one else wants to do that, then I think, since we're already over time, we'll end it there. But if anybody has a question, go ahead. I have a comment, which is to say thank you all so much for all your perspectives and for sharing this with us. It was really great to hear it directly from people. And it's different hearing it from all of you than reading it in a book or an article or anything. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to echo what Gabi said because she said it perfectly. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I definitely learned a lot um, and I'm sure the rest of the attendees did too. Um, so thank you guys very much for being on our panel today. Um, yes, Manraj just sent applause <laughs> and so, so did Gabi. Um, so everyone, I hope um, everyone has a good rest of their day and, you know, stay safe during these scary and somewhat uncertain times and um let's just all practice having empathy for each other <laughs> thank you you thank too you. thank you everybody take care